writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into the crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right path. In this episode, The Right Pack, are going to explore the art of romance writing. In particular, though, the art of writing about healthy romantic relationships. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, producer, crazy man, David Allen Lucas. Author still getting working on his current work in progress called Splintered Eye. Also, martial arts instructor, voice actor, producer, and president of Winding Trails Media, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, and still recovering from Gateway Con. And with me today is my lovely co-host, who is just making a face at her cell phone, the one and only. Hi, I'm Kathleen Kayembe, and I play Pokemon Go. <laughs> We're all stuck. That, 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 that's the exciting thing about her. <laughs> um, so I write speculative fiction. I will be at ReaderCon in July for the Shirley Jackson Awards because my sh- my novelette, You Will Always Have Family in Triptych, was nominated for one. Um, Good I luck. Have yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, girl. Yeah. Congratulations on the mm-hmm. nomination. Yes. Thank you. I have published in Nightmare and Lightspeed magazines, and uh, I have an essay in the Hugo-nominated book, Luminescent Threads, Letters to Octavia E. Butler. Congratulations. Yay. Yay. Yeah. And also with us today, to her right, is our going away to college grad member, school. grad school member. She's in college already. <laughs> and and they're on that guy. She's already got the first round of... Yeah. Um, of college debt. Now on to the next one. Right, on to part two. Uh, my name is Shanelle Chan. I am a writer of stuff. I'm not, um, let's see, right now I'm focusing more on speculative, but I do also do literary. I am frantically, frantically trying to finish my novel um, so that I can get it off to the people that need to see it. And... And I, I think that's it. Why are you frantically working on your novel to get it off to, for people to see it? Yeah. What happened just recently, uh, ta- taping time wise, as she covers her face in embarrassment, <laughs> which she should not be embarrassed? You had a what at Gateway Con mm-hmm. from an agent? Mm-hmm. You had a full <laughs> manuscript request, am I right? Yes. Woo-hoo. Yes. 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 That's awesome. <laughs> to to our to our listening to our listening audience, if you don't know by now, uh, yeah, I tend to have to pull this information out of people. <laughs> That's really what my job is. Okay, and also with us today is because she will never say this herself. Hmm. Top five of St. Louis's St. Louis's readers' choice young. I'm sorry. Yeah, what was it? It was children's children's authors. <laughs> children's authors. One and only. Uh, my name is Jennifer Solzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I've <laughs> been, uh, I've, I've written a, a fantasy novel. I don't know if that's the one that got me the nod to the Post Dispatch, but if it was, that's awesome. Uh, it's called Threadcaster, and you can find it on Amazon and order signed copies from Main Street Books in St. Charles, Missouri. Or perhaps it was Dog Park, which is my picture book, which is also popular and has an animated short. That was uh, award-winning on YouTube. You can look that up and then get the picture book of Dog Park that hopefully will have a sequel out. I'm pushing it to next year because I keep trying to work on it, but I have other things I need to work on. It's it's a horrible tug-of-war trying to maintain multiple lines of books. So you got two dogs pulling on pulling Two dogs park. pulling on a rope. And also with us today is the spy, is the spy captain. No. Spy captain. Is, is, is the sky captain. No, I'm the spy captain. That's what I'm working on. Sky captain of pirates and um, other dirigibles. The one and only <laughs> steampunk dirigibles. dirigibles. Go on. Yes, I'm Brad R. Cook. I am the author of a bunch of steampunk stuff. Uh, you can find the Iron Chronicles online and in print at your local bookstore. You can find... Uh, the Air Draining Adventures as well. And uh, check it out later this year is coming Tales of the Gearblade. 
Uh, and if I sound like I have no idea what I'm doing right now, it's because I'm in an editing cave. And if you've been a long time listener, you know that means uh, I haven't seen sunlight in a while. <laughs> That's and why he's so pale. <laughs> in all honesty, he's hiding from a Madonna murder herself. And we'll <sighs> go out and get him with her poison. No, I'm just joking on the last part. But our Madonna murder. Drink. But our Amos, I write Victoria and Dennis, like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and they him at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And coming in 2019 is Have Your Ticket Punched by Frank James. I'm also president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. And also with us is my wife. Hi, I'm Melanie Lucas. Um, I would like to point out, I believe my husband just uh, dropped the title of his current novel for the first time. Yes, I finally did. did. Yay! Yes. I'm sorry we didn't cheer about it when you dropped it. <laughs> yeah, current working not, working title is Splintered Eye. Ooh, yay! So. We'll wait for that to unpack later. Yeah. Yeah, still recovering from Gateway Con, so I... Uh, not sure either one of us have made much progress so in our race. novel race. <laughs> no, I've been still doing the administra- post, <laughs> post-conference administrative work. Um, but today we are going to talk about writing romantic, health, healthy romantic relationships. Which, if you know, and you follow along with this podcast, you know I try not to write romance. Because I suck at writing romance. So, what? why talk about what? Are not healthy romantic relationships in most books? Or are we showing bad relationships? Or why even talk about the topic? I know this was a topic choice by some of our uh, listeners as well as by members of the Right Pack. So I'm going to just kick the ball over to Kathleen. All right. I know she's just jumping at the bit. Okay. Um, well... Over, over time, our, our view of what is normal in a romantic relationship has changed. Um, Thank goodness. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was reading the book Beyond Heaving Bosoms, A Smart Bitch's Guide to Romance Novels. By That's the best title ever. <laughs> yeah, please repeat Smart, this. Yeah. Smart Bitches Read Trashy Books is, is an awesome website. Um, it's by Sarah Wendell and Candy Tan. And um, I, was, I was reading that to kind of get ready for today. And something I love about the book is it tells you kind of the history of romance novels like starting with like the the 70s like the genre and how it's changed to now like modern romance novels um and like romance novels in the 70s and up through uh, most of the 80s were kind of rapey like a woman could say no and a guy would kind of like kind of force himself on her and that would be seduction that was perfectly acceptable the the alpha alpha male hero was what you wanted Except they, they call him alphas often. Alpha and assholes. Because there are still alpha male heroes now. Yeah, that's uh, that's almost required for mm-hmm. a lot of um, romance imprints is that they need, they always ask the romantic lead to be more alpha. Unfortunately. I've heard that from other authors. I don't write romance, but other authors complaining about the edits they get back from their publisher is your, your lead needs to be more alpha. That's obnoxious. But, but I yeah, entirely. continue, Kathleen. Um, <laughs> but, like, the alpha of the modern romance novel is different from the alpha of the older romance novel. Um, older romance novel alphas were kind of creepy. Like, the <laughs> consent was, was not a thing they did, mm-hmm. necessarily. And um, nowadays we're, we're more recognizing that, like, the things the old alpha had, like, the traits of the old alpha were actually abusive relationship traits. Like, um, uh, cruelty, emotional, uh, um, emotional abuse, Gaslighting. sexual assault, like, mm-hmm. you know, little Isolation. things like that. Isolation. Like, red flag behaviors now were things that women assumed men had to have to be heroes then. And, and we know more things now, and women are allowed to do more things now. So... Um, our understanding of what a healthy relationship is has changed. So romance relationships are, are going the same way because what women expect now out of a relationship is not necessarily what our mothers thought they had to expect and our grandmothers. I'm blanking on the author of this book, and it's okay because it's, it's a series, but what struck me is it, it, had kind, it wasn't really a romance. It was a horror book. 
and this strikes me as like it was a horror book and the thing is the main character was a female werewolf and her well eventually husband was kind of that very alpha and very controlling and all sorts of red warning signs on the other hand that was you know that caused him problems and was explained by everybody as not okay and the reason why he was pretty much a serial killer and she was the only one that could control him so uh that wasn't seen as a good thing this was a horror book not a romance book yeah, and it was right. funny was because bitten? what was that bitten it could be bitten Bitten sounds very familiar, but it could be Bitten, yeah. That's the trouble, you read too many books, they all start like, <laughs> yeah. well, which one was that? Yeah, but this was a good one, like, he turned her into a werewolf and got banished for a while, and... I think yeah, that was, that was bitten. bitten, but it was... The point is... Kelly Armstrong. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I think it's all these behaviors were considered bad things, and it was very interesting to see a character that was so much like that. He actually trusted her. He was very stocky, but it's very interesting to see a combination of a character that all all these red flags as a stalker, but actually absolutely trusts his wife, but would absolutely kill anyone that looks at her the wrong way. It's interesting, and I'm going to jump in, and then I know we've got Fedora, I've got Brandon, and i got Kathleen, and I think all of you guys are doing dovetail. Brandon, are you doing dovetail? I'm not positive. Uh, basically. Okay. <clears throat> I just want to point out one thing. What's interesting, and this is, before, I don't write romance. I have trouble writing romance. But one thing I'm it takes catching, practice to do it well. That, that, that I don't know. Yeah. Um, but one <laughs> thing I'm noticing, just from that little bit of conversation, is the definition of alpha male versus the perceived alpha male. And there really are different... Uh, alpha male doesn't need to do what's already been discussed as what the romance industry, at least at that time was saying an alpha male needed to do. So I'm just going on record saying mm -hmm. that's not exactly what true alpha male behavior, but that's a perception, and that's a bad, wrong, very wrong perception. I'm getting now, I'm getting too down. I Guys, let me ask this question before you jump me. I'm an <laughs> alpha male. Am I any of those things that you said? I'm just going to give you a quote, man. Go for it. Uh, I'm going to quote a uh, romance writer, uh, Jenny Trout. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was referring to to Christian Grey in Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, good. And yeah, this the family. line that he toes between being your your generic alpha male and being an abusive boyfriend. I'm sorry, he was toeing that line? He was, he, yeah, was he like, wasn't. I, I, I'm going to say, I thought he was like hop, skipping, and jumping my way. <laughs> I thought he was uh, the line and then he was way over there. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, ahead, the quote, sorry. and I'm not going to quote it, I was looking it up online, but I couldn't find it word for word, but okay. uh, the, the quote paraphrased is, um, it's, there's, there's something sexy about having a powerful partner, like being in a relationship in which you're not, you know, he's not, um, pre he's not all the time predictable, uh, he's strong, he's, he's forceful, but when that, that playful danger turns into actual fear, it stops being sexy. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the paraphrase of her quote. Is there is something attractive to uh, to people, especially because Fifty Shades likes to, to tout its whole BDSM angle, which there is some contention. Mm -hmm. People who actually have a BDSM lifestyle like to pick it apart for all of the bad things it does, like not honoring safe words and uh, not caring for your partner afterwards. I think like, it's Yes, it's, yeah. it's, it's all very important and it's not yeah, featured can. in Fifty Shades of Grey. But, um, the, uh, it's like there is, there, you know, some people find that attractive and, but it's when you are actually afraid that he's going to hurt you and the fact that Anna Steele spends a good portion of those books huddled in a ball crying in terror from her boyfriend that makes that an abusive relationship versus one that with a, you know, someone who likes to play a submissive in that role play. Okay, you're dovetailing right to me. Okay, go for it. Um, I so, I don't want to get into a huge talk about alpha and beta I males, I just to but that if you do want to hear a huge talk about alpha and beta males, I believe in like seasons one or season one or season two, we talked about creating strong male characters, and there's a bunch of discussion about that in there. Mm -hmm. So, go hear that episode. Cool. Fedora, then Brett. I think that Jennifer hit on something that's really important, and it's the issue of power. The Me Too movement 
has given women a whole new sense of their own power. Yes, yes. And I think that comes clear when you notice that we first get one or two people who will call out a Harvey Weinstein, and then we'll get a hundred. And that tells you not only a lot about Harvey, but also about women. We're maybe a little a little timid about coming forward, but this has created a sea change of, I think, women's feeling of empowerment. And that is certainly going to change the entire phase of romance. And I think it's damn well good time. Mm-hmm. No disagreement for me. Go for it. Actually, it's funny you mention that, because now I'm dovetailing in on you. Uh, so, at Gateway Con, uh, which just happened, uh, great time, um, one of the one of the great workshops that was there was uh, Mora, which is the Missouri Romance Writers of America, did a whole talk of romance, uh, romance in the age of Me Too. Uh, and their talk was very similar to how Kathleen started this episode off, mm-hmm. uh, that the, the industry is changing, um, and it's been changing. I mean, if you look at it, uh, romance has, has slid this way for a while, uh, and I don't know how long, so I'm not even going to try and guess yeah. any of that. I'm not, I don't have my finger on the pulse enough. Uh, but it is the kind of thing where these, uh, themes, I guess one could say, are already kind of being imbibed in some of the books that are coming out now. Uh, but definitely moving forward. I mean, we see this with how many women are taking over politics and other things like that. Uh, industry and, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. So... I would say that uh, beyond that, I just want to throw out that Maura was touching on exactly what you guys were touching on. Fedora, Kathleen, Jan, I think you're oh, yeah, Chanel's in first. And Chanel too. Oh, Chanel was up first? I Ch- Chanel was before I put my hand up. Okay. Now, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> I think Brad is really right about that because 30 years ago, the romance writers who had already developed a notion about this, uh, declaimed that the term bodice ripper, which was a very common expression for romance in the old days, was something they wouldn't tolerate anymore. So I think it's been coming for a long time, and now it's here. It's a mm-hmm. steady evolution. Yep. Over to, okay, well, now I'm kicking it over to Kath. I thought you were next, you know. Um, I had straight to Brad. Yeah. Okay, Kathleen Same. and then Jen. Go for it. Uh, well, I was going to say that... Um, something that is current in romance right now is the the addition of explicit consent, enthusiastic consent um, in uh, sexual relationship scenes. And um, when some people are thinking, like, it's, how do you add, like, are you sure you want to do this? Yes, thank you. I would like to have sex. And it's going to ruin everything. But actually, like... It kills I the a, mood. It's going to yeah. kill the mood. Yeah. It's like um, you stop the action to ask if he had a condom. Mm-hmm. But, like, <laughs> that's, but like, sex is another thing that's had to be put into romance because, you know, women are up on these things. Um, but, like, I, I have a friend who uh, is... Uh, has finished revising her book. I hope. I can't wait for it to be published. Um, but she had a sex scene in there that she wanted me to read because I write erotica for funsies. Um, (laughs) and it was great. And there was enthusiastic consent and there was a condom and none of it messed anything up. It like, it added something to the scene and to their relationship that both of these things came up and it was great. So I I don't see the big deal about adding enthusiastic consent. It doesn't have to necessarily be verbal. Like, there, there are physical things you do to show you are really into a thing. <laughs> so, I mean, you're, you're creative. Be creative. <laughs> you're creative. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, exactly. To dovetail off what Kathleen said, one of, that is one of the things. Um, I, were we both in that workshop at BizCon? I don't know. Possibly we were both in the same place at the same time. Um, <laughs> it was so engrossing. <laughs> no, but I that, wish I'd been there. Um, it was a... Um, that one of the things that readers are almost demanding is more explicit consent because consent is sexy guys. Mm-hmm. Like it, it do a dubious consent has a time and a place. It's in a horror. Novel. Time and place <laughs> is not always forever. Um, another thing that people seem to be wanting, wanting from their romance is more realism in the sense that 
Nobody gets everything right the first time they're with somebody. There's bumbling, there's fumbling, there's weird body noises, there's like somebody's <laughs> elbowing your nose, like it, it, all yeah, sorts of places. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> all sorts of weird random things happen. People are starting to want to see more of that. People want to see bad sex. People want to see bad sex, which is really <laughs> hilarious, but it's true because sex is not only there in a romance novel to titillate. Um, now that being said, there is something to be said for the 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 place that that has within the structure of romance writing but i can get into that later okay jen you've been waiting and i think kathleen you know had another dovetail did you have something to add to it'll it'll come up later okay Okay, over to jen Uh, i just wanted to since i mean i'm i'm the one who keeps who always says that i like to learn by deconstructing other people's mistakes because it absolves me from making the same mistakes (laughs) um but uh i wanted to get us on to sort of the title card of this episode which is tips for writing uh healthy romantic relationships and my tip i will start us off with is remembering that a a romance a marriage a, a coupling of any kind is a partnership, and that both members of that partnership have equal agency and, and humanity and mental powers to uh, make decisions and influence the way the story goes. Now, I'm not a perfect example of having been well read in romance and so forth, but I am going to throw out something that makes a perfect ex- takes the, takes what you said as a perfect example. Don't cry over there because I know I'm going to mention a certain favorite character of yours. Yeah, my my bouquet is large. You can probably throw a dog anyway, at it. Anyway, what I was going to say is a great example of that is from Firefly Serenity. Oh, it <laughs> is Walt, Walt, Wash, and, Wash, Wash and Zoe. And Zoe. Mm-hmm. If he wasn't already married to Zoe, he'd be mine. <laughs> so with that, if, no, if for some reason you haven't seen that, there, there. It's, no, it's plenty of places you can watch it online. You brought it up and you pointed directly at me, so you have to let me gush for just a half second. Go for it. Why they're perfect? Yes, uh, they're perfect because they're both strong and dif- they're both strong in different aspects of their relationship. Um, Zoe's attracted to Wash's humor. Wash is attracted to the fact that he could break her with his pinky, or the other side, she could break him with her pinky. Um, they're, they definitely enjoy each other's company more than just, you know, sexually or whatever. They like being around each other. And they've got, uh, in addition to just chemistry, they actually are allowed to start the, the show married. Yeah. They're an actual married couple, and they've got that easy sense of, I've committed to you for my entire life, and I am 100% okay with that. And that, that dynamic just makes them so attractive. I love them so much. Okay, I'm done. And they and they don't have to go out of the way to show their affection. No, it's so. it's uh, unspoken. It's looks and and jokes and the fact that they've got they share little private bits that other uh-huh. people aren't really not that they're not allowed in, but it's like they spend a lot of time together and they can give a look and laugh at the same joke without saying anything. Um, so something uh, from Beyond Heaving Bosoms that they talked about was um, the the obsession with women being virgins back in the seventies. <laughs> Like, like, and the, forever, you know, that goes back. Yeah, yeah we're it getting does. like it it's does. changing now. Women are allowed to be like sexually woke <laughs> nowadays and like have had partners before the the mighty wang of the hero. Um, <laughs> that is that is a quote. Steal that quote. The hero's mighty wang, capital letters, thanks. Um, but like. Oh, goodness. But, like, the sex that the woman has had before can't necessarily have been as good. Like, he is the king of her orgasms, and, and like, that's that's why they're MFEO, I guess. Um, but now that women are allowed to have had, like, other sexual partners and be knowledgeable about sex, like, romance books are kind of shifting to, like, the, the hero gives her a different kind of awakening. Like, he's an expert in something, and she totally doesn't understand it. Like... They're, they're shifting the balance of power to other areas because sexually now a woman and a man can be equal in a romance relationship. Um, and this is just like the... Beyond Eating Bosoms is just about het relationship, heterosexual relationships. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get into queer relationships of any kind so far. So um, just be aware that like power dynamics are different in a queer relationship than they are in a heterosexual relationship just because of heteronormative gender roles and... Mm-hmm 
both people being the same gender, it doesn't it doesn't translate nearly so much. Well, can you unpack that in a little bit too? Um, so one of the reasons I like reading gay romance is that like they're both dudes, so there's not a lot of the gender role issues that you have that make me angry from <laughs> <laughs> sexual romance. So like uh, I hope you know by now that like in a gay relationship, one person is not the man and the other person is not the woman. That does no, like that doesn't generally apply to people. Pause. Mm -hmm. Repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> in a gay relationship, one partner is not the man and the other is not the woman. They're they're the same gender, and that's fine. The the, the heteronormative gender roles don't apply. And I love that because the relationship can be about something other than, you know, I have to be the man of the relationship and I have to be the woman of the relationship. Like, it can just be about two people who are meeting as equals in terms of social class, I guess. And it can be more about the relationship, which I enjoy. Are you I know you're dovetailing. Are you dovetailing? More or less. Okay. Just a <laughs> quick caveat. Right. And then over to you. I, I had to have Kathleen repeat that because... You, you think this doesn't happen, but I have had conversations with people at a wedding for a relative of mine and his new husband. And the conversation literally went like, so who's going to carry the bouquet? Who's, whose mama's giving them away? Are, are, are their dads giving them away? What do we do if they kiss? Like... What do you do if they kiss? Oh my god. I, so I was kidding. That's why I had to have her repeat. <laughs> These gender roles need not apply. Oh, uh, if you want to see that in a comedy, <laughs> watch the Key and Peel gay wedding sketch where a poor a poor person has to explain this to a family all of these questions about the gay couple getting married. What do we do if they kiss, though? It came up. <laughs> that was probably but oh, back over to you. And Sorry, we digress. So silly. We digress. Gender roles were once very much specified, not just by custom, but by law. Take, for example, laws against rape. This suggests that the woman is merely some kind of appendage of the man, and so there were laws in which the rapist, if caught, could be executed just for the rape. This would, don't you think, encourage the rapist to kill the woman? Mm -hmm. Because the penalty was exactly the same. And it suggests that we're not concerned at all about the woman. We are concerned about the man that she's appended to. Wasn't there also like a custom where if a man rapes a woman, he has to marry her? So in she's the just Bible. stuck with him? Well, and also that happened to in, some, Dinah in, in the Bible. No, um, no, it didn't yeah. because her brothers came to the rescue. Well, <laughs> okay, but I love that story. <laughs> it's a good story. But but damn, damn. Okay. Right. Uh, also, anyway, to answer your question, also in semi-modern, I mean, within living memory, U.S. history law, that was still the case too. Yeah. So um, just point that out because, like, she was ruined because her virginity was gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's not even get into the fact that Virginia is a society. But, guys, uh, guys, but anyway, I, well, real quick, yeah, hold on, I'm sticking to this for just one more second because I love this one to death. So I'm a huge fan of history and I'm a huge yeah. fan of like Game of Thrones and all that kind of crap. But here's my thing. I cannot, as a modern male, imagine having to deal with the property rights issues and the whole dowry thing and... Never meeting my wife, but just going and talking to her father. Mm -hmm. And, like, all of, like, that whole yeah. notion that is, like, our past and our history of, like, many, many moons and many, many Not centuries. That many. No, I don't mean long ago. <laughs> I mean how long that existed. Yeah. And history. I don't get it. Because as a guy in a modern male, and it's not that I... I don't want to take that much time to manage other people. <laughs> and I don't mean, like, just necessarily all the women in my life and stuff. But, like, the notion that I have to do this for all my sisters and... My aunts and, you know, anyone who didn't have a direct male relative. Like, all of this notion is just, like, ugh, weird. Yeah. So, as a modern reader and a modern person going forward, I think we are, A, detaching less and less from these kinds of notions because the world itself has changed. But, two, we live in an entirely different society now. And, yes, men really need to change uh, and get woke. 
in a serious way. I'm just like woke. <laughs> yeah. It, well, that's the start, and then maybe we can get some other things to come out of that. But it is one of the crazy things that I, I think these notions that are sometimes so old, and when you really break them down, some of them are really ridiculous. And painful so, to men. They were horrible for men, too. Yeah, no argument. Here's the question, though. How do we write about a healthy relationship? Yes. Tips. I need to get us back on task. <laughs> we, we've gone down some different roads here, but how do we write about healthy relationships? Over to you, Kathleen and Chanel. Well, uh, I think what Jennifer said about like equal partnership is really important. Um, and what you brought up about Wash and Zoe was also important. Like You can have different strengths and and that is a good thing. So um, those are really important. People being attracted to each other is important. Um, it unless be it's without a, saying, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Um, be, be unless it's an asexual romance, in which case, like, they don't have to be physically attracted, but romantically attracted, if it's a romance, yes, needs to be there. Um, and mutual care and respect have to be there. Like... Mm -hmm. If there's a firefight, Wash is not going to be the one they send in first. Mm -hmm. And he is okay with that mm -hmm. because he is confident enough as a person to know his strengths generally. <laughs> yeah. there, there are times, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, everyone's a complex human being with many facets and good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. You but try like, standing next to Nathan Fillion all day long. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, there is there is an episode about that, actually, in Firefly, where yeah. Wash feels jealous and, like, he's not good enough for his wife because he's not a fighter. And they have to work through that. And in a healthy relationship, you do have those conversations. And, and you have to have the open communication to be able to deal with things like that as they come up. So I've got healthy Chanel. communication. Sorry, I've got Chanel, Jen, Melanie. Chanel. Um, another thing that a uh, pro tip. <laughs> pro tip, yeah. Um, agency. Yes. Agency is incredibly important. For example, like if if you have like in if we were to say hero one and hero two instead of hero and heroine or male and female, mm -hmm. um, hero one's decisions can't all be based on hero two's actions. Hero one has agency of their own. Mm -hmm. Hero two has agency of their own. They make decisions together. That's great. Sometimes, hopefully, <laughs> romantic couples do that. But it, it, it's like if you have a set of characters where one does not have agency, that's bordering on red flag territory and should be avoided. Okay, let's go over to Jen, Noni. Then I'm gonna go back here to <laughs> Kathleen, and I know Brad, you still get your hand up. We're just right now. We're all. We, I'm hitting all the dovetails. Yeah. So the, uh, dovetail in order as best I got it. I wanted to like highlight also in with with agency with being equal humans in the relationship because everyone is a human being and they've lived an entire life prior to the events of your book. Mm -hmm. uh, the and I go crazy for character all the time. I wanted to point out also that you're writing, you know, it's like we're telling you all these do's and don'ts of things to do about writing healthy relationships. But uh, you're also writing a story. And it's okay if your your loving couple is not perfect from the get-go. Like, one could be a controlling bastard, and the other one could be uh, a bit of a wallflower and afraid to speak up. But the whole point of the story is that you grow, change, and learn. And that should not be framed as the ideal situation. It's like, have them become a couple that is a, an actual healthy couple, and that's romantic, versus a controlling bastard who pushes the wallflower around all the time. Uh, that is a different kind of story. That's not something that uh, is specifically a female reader, but, you know, male readers who enjoy romance as well. Uh, it's, not, it's not fun to watch someone being miserable or used. It's like you want to be able to put yourself in the shoes of at least one member of the group. <laughs> the controlling male pushes the wallflower around. The wallflower kicks him in the balls, hammer fists him in the face, and breaks the net and walks away casually. And he Go learns ahead. a valuable lesson about respecting his partner, and they all live happily ever after. No, he's, he's, he's dead. He's got broken neck. Oh, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he died. Before this little tangent, I think this was kind of a dovetail, mostly a dovetail to Chanel, but kind of a dovetail to Jen, but. What I was going to say has a lot to do with agency mm -hmm. and some, a lot to do with not ideal to start with. Mm -hmm. And when you have a relationship, pay attention to the power dynamics in the relationship. And perhaps some of your conflict and some of your 
unidealness to begin with could be a power imbalance. Namely, in a lot of setups, one person, usually the male, in fact, there's a whole subclass of romance where it is the male, had, is super successful, super wealthy, this mm-hmm. classic Cinderella story. Well, mm-hmm. guess what? That is a huge power imbalance. Mm-hmm. So how is that going to form a healthy relationship? It's not impossible, but boy, that's set up for abuse. So how is that going to be set and up? What a good story to show how that turns into a romantic, healthy relationship. And guess what? They're in a natural relationship, so they're going to be conflict, not necessarily fights, but disagreements and people setting boundaries mm-hmm. and testing boundaries and working things out. Mm-hmm. Over to Kathleen and then I think Brett. Oh, yeah. Um, it's important for people to, to have their own lives and relationships outside the relationship, the romantic relationship. Um, when one, when one partner's life becomes completely like begins to completely revolve around the other person, that is not a healthy relationship. It's a stalker relationship. Or, it's, so or, it's not to be controlled. Or it's, it, or it's Twilight. <laughs> 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 wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. Let's be stalker and Twilight. Yeah. <laughs> Twilight novels, the right? relationship in Twilight, the relationship in Fifty Shades of Grey, those are not healthy romantic relationships. Those, there are all kinds of warning signs to abusive relationships, and I can read a bunch of them if you'd like, and Twilight just like checks them all off. Mm-hmm. Please do. <laughs> um, extreme possessiveness is a red flag. Disregarding boundaries is a red flag. Controlling behavior, physical aggression, keeping secrets, ignoring pe- ignoring your partner in a time of need, gaslighting, which is huge. No, we should define gaslighting for the audience. Okay. Um, it's a term that's used to describe when one partner brainwashes the other to question their own sanity or the reality of the world around them. So... Basically, you're trying to get your partner to doubt their own perception of the world and, and what is true and whatever has happened. Oh, honey, I I never said those things to you. Were you dreaming? Was, mm-hmm. Were you drinking again? Oh, I never called you those names. You're so silly. I like it when you're when you're silly like that. You should probably just forget about all that stuff that happened last night. There are two versions of the movie Gaslight, and both are extremely instructive. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then uh, unpredictable mood swings or angry blow-ups. Excessive worry. I worry so much about you. I'm following you everywhere and not saying sorry. Those are all things that you should be aware of. Brad and then Fedora. Cool. I actually, I would say Twilight hit on every single one of those. <laughs> uh, check yeah. it off because I was. Um, <laughs> but what I was going to actually throw out is that uh, so a big part of modern day romance telling, I guess, would be a big part of it. And, and I did this, so I'm totally guilty, but I did it before now, which means it's okay. We <laughs> learned. Uh, but it is the, the gender-flipping roles. And when I say that, I mean you have traditional story where male character acts the, you know, is the guy with the sword, and female character acts as, you know, person who knows things or... Yeah, the, walks the along smart one, the healer. Exactly. <laughs> Enter in whichever character class you want. And now we flip those. So woman is a warrior and dude is the one who knows things. And He's the cleric. I, I wrote that story. I intentionally made Genevieve the swordswoman uh, on purpose, but not because I wanted a woman, the woman role to be the fighter. I wanted her to be strong and all that kind of stuff. Here's my point. Uh, I think we're past that. So you got to be more creative than that. <laughs> um, I think that some of the gender flipping movies that we have coming down the pipeline from Hollywood are going to kill this entire notion of, you know, flipping the gen- just flipping the gender, nothing else, like just mm-hmm. taking a male character and giving it to the woman's role or to the female. And having you know. that be edgy enough. Yes, mm-hmm. and having that be oh now she's strong and now she's you know a modern woman and all that kind of crap. So don't do that. <laughs> be more inventive. Be more creative. Invent people who are actually strong-willed and have character traits that are important. And moving forward is you create female characters. And I mean this more to men who might do this than women, because women are going to be very good at creating female characters. We have a lot of experience. Exactly. <laughs> um, so dudes uh, out there in writing land... Um, maybe pick up another book that's written by a woman and see how she wrote a woman. Um, maybe go see a ton of movies or uh, immerse yourself in. Yeah. 
immerse yourself in you Don't know. Don't watch the Last Jedi either. Ray's <laughs> actions are ridiculous. Exactly. Okay, well, so we'll maybe Hollywood is a bad idea. <laughs> but there are other avenues to go down that you can get you know actual <laughs> strong women, and then more importantly, watch Black base Panther. them on <laughs> actual strong women. This is what I recommend the most because there are a ton of them out there. Uh, and if you take certain traits from these people and, you know, kind of mesh them again to Serpento style, uh, you know, this is going to be uh, um, a way of creating a good character that then you can put into a good romance. And if you're looking for happy romances, I say go and try and mirror some of those if they exist. Can't think of the Fedora. Oh, uh, Brad, what you were saying... Um, Okay, so there's a few things. So Black Panther and Hidden Figures, I would recommend. Um, yeah, those so had good. those had so women good. involved in the writing process. Like, if you're watching Hollywood movies, you want women involved in the writing process, and preferably other things as well. Um, but we we have the uh, the trope of the strong female character yeah. right now, played by. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez. I love her so much. Oh, I could watch her kill things all day. Um, all day. But uh, there's the, the strong female character right now is just like a woman with alpha male characteristics. Yeah. And that is not the only definition of strength by a long shot. Like, I, I understand that we have Robert Downey Jr. being like a martial arts badass as Sherlock Holmes. But generally in the stories for Sherlock Holmes, he's not murdering people right and left. He's not taking people down. And he's still a really strong character without having to, like, do epic beatdowns. He's strong because he's substantial. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the reasons he needed Watson. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) And, like, women can do the same thing. Like, a strong female character does not have to, you know, be the biggest badass in the room or, like, be domineering or... What are some alpha male tendencies? Uh... Uh, being uh, in a leader, being like the the gruff leader who doesn't take no for an answer mm-hmm. and uh, punching a wall to prove a point does not have to be a rage monster. There you go, like because that's the only acceptable uh, emotional. Yeah, men can area. only be angry. They're yeah. not allowed to be sad, and they're barely allowed to be happy in, mm-hmm. in poorly written stories. Yeah. They're always. Either angry or stoic lone wolf type exactly. people. Stoic. Which, is, so glad you which said is one of the reasons poorly written that poorly written masculinity yeah. is so bad for men too. We're not talking um, about the good stuff here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're supposed to be giving good pointers, but it's we're deconstructing. Yeah. So like there there are other ways to write strong female characters than than just like alpha male tendencies. Like yes. and there are other ways to write, you know, awesome romantic heroes than the alpha male characteristics. Like um who is it? Newts. Commander, Commander from um, <laughs> Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them yes. is not an alpha male, but he no. is fabulous and I love him. He's adorable. <laughs> yeah, he, he's what you would call a beta male, but he is the best ever. And I advise people to write more people like that, like him, like Wash. Those are great characters. Yeah. Okay, I have I've lost between who's dovetailing, so I'm gonna go Bing okay. Bing, and I think are you back here at the door? I don't know. Um. What I was going to say is that there are more than one way to write femininity. Mm-hmm. There is more than one way to be a woman. And in today's day and age, you damn well better believe that women are going to be looking for more than just the passive, submissive, the um, maiden who faints at the sight of anything dramatic or blood or whatever. I never like, quite understood the whole blood thing given menstruation. Right. <laughs> you would think that we'd be good with blood, but that's, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Um, but there's there's more than one way to be a woman. And you mentioned Black Panther. Black Panther is an excellent way because it doesn't just give you, it gives you one, two, three, four, or five, a, a bajillion different ways in which women can be strong and women can be fierce and women can still be woman and not a man in a woman suit. Mm. Um, okay, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna say anything else about that. Go ahead. All right. Um, I think it's important. I'm. I while I agree wholeheartedly that there needs to be more, uh, uh, less aggressive male uh, romantic characters in romances that there's uh there's also all right i start over sir um 
I would love to read more stories about um, teen girls who fall in love with the quirky nerd because that's <laughs> my life story. It's like I want to fall in love with the guy in Swim Choir. <laughs> I don't want to. Uh, I don't necessarily want to date the jock type unless he also really, really likes Star Trek. Like, there's there's different types of people who are attracted to different types of things, but the the romance writing industry, novel writing industry, has a certain tendency to favor that alpha male stereotype. They ask their authors to write toward that. So, um, while yes, I encourage everyone, please write Newt's Commanders and uh, Hoban Washburn's, please, and bring him to life so I can date him. Um, what are some tips that people have for making a powerful male lead that's not in the traditional powerful male lead kind of way? Can I say one thing real quick that's going to get me in trouble? Mm-hmm. Maybe. These people need to learn where a real alpha male is and move on. <laughs> Go ahead. That, serious. I'm, I'm well, serious. What's your tips? That. What are your tips for writing uh, well, you know, actually, a strong male character? Actually, let me define not... what an alpha male is. I was just looking this up, making sure my definition mm-hmm. of alpha male fit mm-hmm. the real definition of an alpha male. And I've got, there's 25 points here, and I'll just read the short versions of them. The alpha male is persistent. They, they don't quit. There's no quit in them. They don't give up. The alpha male can defend himself and his family. The alpha male can be is usually in peak physical shape. Well, that one, uh, admittedly, <laughs> may have to lose some weight. The alpha male is courageous. He doesn't lack fear. Rather, he accepts it and moves on, moves through it. The alpha male can entertain. The alpha male has stories to tell. He lived. Alpha, the alpha male can laugh at himself. He is humble. I'm say, saying the alpha male all the time. Just assume I'm talking about alpha male. He is humble. He is learned and educated. He may have a degree, but that's not necessarily required. He is a man's man, meaning he's he's a hard guy not to like and to have a beer with. He's tough, but often quiet, composed, and can tell a joke or shoot the blank with someone. He knows how he knows the value of every word. He doesn't just talk simply to hear the sound of his own voice. He has a purpose. He is a hard worker. He is a warrior, not a warrior, meaning he doesn't have to worry about control or worry about the future because he's already working to make the future what he wants the future to be. He doesn't pick a fight, but he sure in hell is going to end it if he's in one. He has a style of his own. He knows who he is. He He values. His values govern his life. He also knows how to treat a lady, meaning he respects women, often because he's had some great ones in his life. The, he is not a sucker. He is also not a clinging, clinging person. Um, I already said about value. Yes, sir. He helps others. He's generous. Does he embrace the full range of human emotion? I. Keep on going What's here. your list from? Well, I'll read, I'll read that off in a minute. Um, um, he also sees opportunity where others see, see failure. He leads by example. He is stubborn. I admit I am stubborn. Hmm. Um, and he doesn't try... He, he doesn't, an alpha male doesn't try to be the alpha male. doesn't have to be. Does he have... Does he list all the examples? This doesn't... All, all the emotions. He may not show them all the time to people, to everyone, because I will tell you the truth, and this is on my own personal life. People will take advantage of you when you're showing weaknesses in front of them. Your friends, your real friends, that's not something you have to worry about. You just said he is about emotions. Yeah, I did. Let me use an example. When I was in seventh and eighth grade, when I transferred schools, if I dare showed any emotional weakness. Around them, I showed that they had hurt my feelings in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, that's that would have been that, okay. That's also uh, uh, also great. in the office. Yeah. I had so, I had a, to romance. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> yeah, 
Um, I, I have think had... that does go into alpha males aren't supposed to show their feelings, or at least not the full range of their feelings. Well, but they no, do they're choosers. Yes. They choose to show it in front of And in a romance relationship, that is a way to show that you care. And what the, you know, the man cares about the woman is that exactly. he's allowed to be vulnerable in front of mm-hmm. Exactly. Is, I think bringing that up is important, actually. Being uh, in a healthy relationship, both partners are able to be vulnerable, vulnerable with vulnerable. one another. <laughs> and, like take strength from one another. One person is not always giving strength or being strong. Like they're strong in different ways and those ways complement each other. Like I'm going to stop there. No, no, I'm glad you brought it up. Cause I'm gonna say, and then I'm going to go to Chanel. I know you're also dovetailing, mm-hmm. but I want to answer this directly. I've been before I got with my wife, I was in a very unhealthy relationship. The person was basically a con woman. If you will, if I did, sh- if I when I tried to show myself being open to her in that way, yeah, that was the worst mistakes I could have made. It became it became tools for her to use to twist and turn. That's an unhealthy relationship. An unhealthy relationship. We we're talking about writing a healthy relationship. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I was saying when I say the alpha male shows his relation shows his emotions in front of somebody, it's, it's the people he trusts. Which might be a good way to show emotional development in your healthy relationship. Exactly. I would agree. That's why I'm going with that. Chanel, you had a dovetail, and I'm coming over to Fedora and then Brad. So I'm hijacking this this wagon right now. Thank you. Um, (laughs) Sorry, it's my show now. Um, (laughs) So I have been sitting on this little gem for the entirety of this show. And before we run out of time, darn it, I'm going to throw it out there. There is a book that I read in preparation for this show. (laughs) It is called Romancing the Beat, Story Structure for Romance Novels, also known as How to Write a Kissing Book. (laughs) Now, if you are looking for something that gives you more insight into character, into the types of characters, your alpha male, your beta male, your your different types of female protagonists, this ain't the book. (laughs) This ain't the one. But... If you are looking for a step-by-step breakdown of the beats that you need, well, hmm, the most popular array of beats that are hit within a romance plot, this book breaks it down into what they call a beat sheet. There is another thing that you guys mentioned, and I want to make sure that we're all clear here. We're, we're talking about romance, mm-hmm. and this book says quite explicitly you have you can have several themes in your romance you can in, in expand on and subvert various gen- gender roles etc but at the end of the day your theme for this romance is that love conquers all mm. period mm. now that could be in terms of a happily ever after that could be in terms of a happily for now that could be in terms of uh, several things but at the end of the day you're writing about love and what these characters have to go through to get to it. Now, the way that this author, um, the way that this author sets it up is that each character has what they would call a hole in their heart that for whatever reason keeps them from getting to love. And I think that's one of the things that you guys were kind of touching on with like the lack of emotional availability, etc. But one of the things that you have to do in a romance is to show them subverting that and getting around that to get to the wholehearted, W-H-O-L-E, hearted, Mm -hmm. um, ending, which is where we want to see them at. The author's name, by the way, is Gwen Hayes. Cool. Nice. Oh, uh, it's possible to write romance in other genres. It's Mm -hmm. entirely possible. There are a lot of... There are a lot of things. Like, there are romances in action movies and action books. I like got romance there are, in a steampunk. There are, like, <laughs> paranormal romances, and there are urban fantasies with romance in them. A lot of things have romance in them that are not necessarily romance books. Or... And and in those, you don't necessarily have to have that whole happy ending. And he doesn't, the guy doesn't have to get the girl if it's not a romance book. Yes. If it just has a romance, romantic it, relationship. But if it is a romance... 
there needs to be a happily ever after or a happily for now. If that is not what happens at the end of your book, it is not a romance. Do not lie to people. And this is a genre rule. Yes. 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 So we're talking about romance with a capital R as in the spot in Barnes & Noble where that book belongs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Iron Chronicles can fit into the romance section. It's not not a romance. That is a tragedy. tragedy. Um, To quote, the, the biggest of the expectations... In a romance is the happily ever after, H-E-A, or the H-F-N, the happily for now. If love doesn't conquer all at the end of your story, you didn't write a romance. You might have written a great story with romance elements, but if your characters don't have a fi- don't find a happy re- resolution, then you need to find a different shelf for your finished book to live on. Mm-hmm. It's not a bad thing, it's just not a romance thing. And with that, I guess we'll end this here. I hope we've covered enough of how to write a healthy relationship in romance. So, well, we if, if you if you our listeners feel we didn't cover everything, I think there's still some holes. Ha ha ha! Hole in the heart. Yes. If you feel there's any holes, please leave us comments or either on our Facebook page, YouTube, or Blog Talk Radio, and we'll see those and we'll try to make another episode. With that, tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Thank you for listening, and please share this episode with all of your writing friends. The new theme songs for Write Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.